Hello, folks. Hope everyone is doing well uh, this afternoon. Uh, my name is Joe Furla, and I am going to go through the uh, Organize Your Technicians for Operational Efficiency Bootcamp. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started with a couple housekeeping items as we continue to let people join us today. Um, and as always, of course, we start with uh, uh, legal uh, coming in to say hi. And of course, it's three things as always. First off, today's session will be recorded. Um, however, I cannot send the deck or the PowerPoint from today's boot camp out. Um, this is a uh, brand new boot camp. It's the second time I've offered it. Um, first time being this morning. So please do keep in mind there will be a recording of this inside the MSP Institute. However, um, we do have to let marketing and legal and all that jazz go through it before we post the recording. Um, so please be patient with us there. As always, if we talk about any forward facing items uh, in today's conversation in regards to development or PM, please do take everything I say time wise with a grain of salt. While I am uh, giving you folks the most accurate information that I have um, uh, at this particular moment in time, uh, please note I'm not dev, I'm not PM. So while I know their schedule now, I don't know where it'll be in, you know, tomorrow. Um, so please uh, do keep that in mind if we talk about any forward-facing roadmap items. Outside of that, we're going to get into the introduction and a couple housekeeping items, um, and then we'll go over what we are going to see in today's boot camp. So first off, for my introduction, my name's Joe Furla. I've worked here at Enable for about six years. I started inside the channel, channel sales department. I was actually hired right after the Logic Now acquisition. Um, spent about a year there and then moved into the sales engineer role. Um, from the sales engineer, I became a partner success manager here at Enable. And then from the sales, or sorry, the partner success role, I then joined the head nerd team. Quite happy to be here as a head nerd um, and quite happy to be on this operational efficiency side uh, because my degree is in business administration. And while I do tend to hold more technical boot camps, the operational efficiency side lets me uh, play around with that degree. Now, in regards to today's boot camp, so this is a brand spanking new boot camp. Um, so when we look at our agenda and we see polls, please do keep in mind, uh, I haven't actually added any polls to this boot camp yet. Um, outside of the traditional, are you the owner, executive, director in your organization, support, sales, operations, that kind of deal? I couldn't quite think of any really good polls targeted for this particular boot camp. Um, so if you folks have any suggestions, feel free to email me, joseph.furla at enable.com. Um, outside of that as well, again, this is the second time we've done this particular boot camp. So any feedback, positive or negative or constructive on this particular boot camp is always going to be much appreciated. Okay, um, I think this is quite a valuable topic for us to go over and I want to make sure that we're hitting our target audience with it today. Um, that being said, on the agenda, we're going to go over five different tech support structures that we see very commonly in MSPs, um, working our way up our uh, uh, operational maturity model, you know, starting with our, our uh, altogether or free for all style tech structure, going over an overview, how the structure works, pros and cons and KPIs. And then we'll repeat that same cadence with tiers, tiers with specialties, the use of a technical account manager and tiers, as well as a tech support structure that we're going to deem pods. Okay. Um, this morning, I went for just shy of two hours, um, though there was a lot of interaction in that particular boot camp. Um, so I would expect us to fall within the hour 15 um, to hour and a half range, uh, unless we are seeing as much interaction. Um, but to be quite honest, I will say I don't think I've ever gotten that many questions in a boot camp before, um, uh, as there was a lot of folks who did uh, participate quite heartily, for lack of a better term, in that boot camp. 
So anywho, let's drop into what we're going to be looking at today, right? Again, we're going to be building our way up our maturity model, right? Where we see the four different styles of IT service providers with break, fix, a la carte, proactive and fully managed. Proactive and fully managed, fitting nicely and neatly into the bucket of what is a managed service provider. Break, fix, and a la carte, still being items we may offer as an MSP, right? And being the uh, uh, services that we offered in the beginning right? Because everybody starts somewhere, um, but items that tend to fall more in that broader ITSP bucket. So we start with the altogether or the no tiers, the free for all, the generalists type structure, which of course is going to be geared towards smaller MSPs, right? That may or may not be operationally efficient, but uh, uh, folks that are focusing on the break, fix, and more a la carte style items. We then step into our next tiered or next uh, structures with the tiered without specialties and tiers with specialties, bringing us up that maturity model while still being effective at managing a break fix style shop or an a la carte services style shop. We're now seeing our MSPs evolve into the, those proactive and fully managed uh, shops as well. Um, of course, tiered with specialties being something that we see quite commonly across every level of IT service providers, which is including you know, full-fledged operationally mature MSPs that are offering a, a large portion of their packages as proactive and fully managed. Right? Then we're going to look at our larger, more operationally efficient MSPs that are almost entirely proactive and fully managed with the technical account managers combining some of our client retention actions that we would see from a customer success or account management style role into our tech support structure through familiarity and consulting and the like. And we'll also take a look at PONS that's going to attack that same style of service provider, but each of these attacking it from a different perspective. The technical account manager coming from, of course, the more technical side, the pods coming into this with more of a client retention and client familiarity slant. So coming a little bit more from the customer service side of this. Okay. So we start off with the altogether or the no tiers style service uh, provider. And we're gonna see this typically in smaller uh, ITSPs or MSPs. And we're going to see this in an organization that is typically five technicians or under, right? Where we're gonna see this most often at the you know one to two technician or help desk technician range. Right, maybe up to three or four. And we're gonna see these with our least operationally efficient MSPs more often than not. Not saying that you can't be operationally efficient as an MSP without tiers. I've seen it, okay? Um, one of the MSPs that I interviewed for this particular bootcamp actually is one of the more operationally efficient that I have talked to. Um, not because they focus on operational efficiency, but because their customer service goals are so high. Right, uh, actually saw real life reporting come from their ticketing system where their average time to response was 45 minutes, above and beyond best in class. You cannot have that if we're not operationally efficient, right? But we see the lack of operational efficiency here and some of the difficulties for implementing operational efficiency in the fact that there is very little structure in this tech support system. There's little to no escalation other than, you know, leaning over and tapping the shoulder of the person next to you, right? There's no designated of designation of specialties, so workloads and that kind of deal tend to be very disparate across our technicians, right? Our, our clientele. Uh, have very little uh, 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 more so familiarity or consulting type services coming from these technicians, right? We are really living in this break fix a la carte world. You call me, I fix the problem, right? And it goes without saying that that fits very well. 
Okay. While we always want to drive efficiency in our organizations, this is still a good fit for those smaller MSPs. And when we look at this particular tier, that doesn't mean that it comes without its benefits when we say there's little or no operational efficiency here, right? We have the cons of this structure, but these can be taken and turned into benefits, right? Because our goal is as a business owner, never to sit here for a lengthy time without implementing operational efficiency. We made like being the small, almost boutique style uh, break fix a la carte, or if you're actually able to pull it off, like the partner I mentioned earlier, fully managed MSP at this level, but we need to take into account what we're dealing with here, right? The cons of this is documentation tends to be very lacking, right? Knowledge sits inside our technicians' heads sheerly because we have so few technicians. I go back to, I mentioned there's little to no escalation path here other than reaching over and tapping the shoulder of the person next to you, right? Because of that ease and because of that, the time necessary to start building out our SOPs and our SOWs and the like, right? That is our knowledge base, right? Is ourselves. And that knowledge being stuck in our technician's head, of course, is always going to be a negative because if anybody leaves, they take that intrinsic knowledge with them. On site work tends to be quite difficult here because there's little to no differentiation amongst roles by position, right? All, all say three of our generalist technicians are all going to be handling on-site or remote help desk services, right? And it could be based off of specialty, which also means we're going to have the difficulty of if, say, my domain expert is already working on a ticket, I don't want to send say, my Linux expert down that path for on-site work or anything along those lines. So handling this and maintaining efficiency tends to become very difficult, right? Automation of anything above and beyond those reactive items tends to be very difficult to create since a technician's time at the break, fix, and a la carte level is dedicated to their billable hours. That is where they are generating the revenue and income for the business and taking time away from that outside of the downtime when there's not tickets is an incredibly difficult thing to do, right? So when we look at projects like the routine uh, uh, automation of maintenance, right? We look at this being incredibly difficult, right? We look at any type of proactive automation. If we're lucky enough in the a la carte world to have a RMM agent on a device as being incredibly difficult to create because the time requirements just aren't there. We see reporting becoming incredibly difficult here. I use the example of response time wildly varying across our week to week, month to month, quarter to quarter, year to year reporting, right? Because ticket volume and complexity generate that metric more than the dedication and efficiency of our technicians. If I have three technicians that are working on an incredibly complex ticket, each of them, my response time is going to be tanked because I have no more resources there. If everybody's working on tier one tickets, they can finish in like 15 minutes worth of time. My response time goes through the roof. And it's very hard to normalize out these reporting items as we look at things more complicated like utilization rate. We look at our ticket volumes. We look at our mean time to resolution. We look at our first time to resolution KPIs, right? Training becomes very difficult because again, our time constraints inside these types of organizations. And while it can happen, Right. It also is something that, well, we're really hoping that these technicians are coming in with the experience, right, which makes it harder on us to hire because we're doing much more detailed vetting of the technicians that are being brought into this generalist role. Right? if we don't hire well, we see a large negative ad or a large adverse effect upon our organization. And typically that starts to get recognized in our revenue. Right. And then workloads lopsided where it can be, right? Depending on how many tickets come in at one point in time and which technician gets the most difficult ticket to deal with, right? We're now seeing one 
one technician handling 15 tickets at a time while one is working on an incredibly complex and in-depth problem, right? Workload becoming something that's hard to balance here, right? Now, that being said, being inside this tech support structure, we do see benefits from this, right? We look at the fact that we did put the time and effort into hire these experienced generalists inside this particular structure, and we can look at uh, 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 utilizing that particular tool. If they do have downtime, have them start working on a knowledge base. If we are moving ourselves up the maturity model to a tiered support structure or to a more complex structure, we now have a technician that makes a good tier two or tier three technician, right? We have that home baked in and we can internally promote. Right. We have the ability to look at automating outside of our routine maintenance and proactive automation where we can get our technicians to affect their individual day to day work by looking at creating automation that directly affects those techs lives on a daily basis, which graduates with us no matter what part of the maturity model we're with and gives us a basis to start building out some standard operating procedures for our varying ticket types. The hard part, again, is finding the time. Taking an hour of a technician's time in a tech support structure where there is no tiers and we're dealing with such a small business, again, like one to three, one to four technicians, right? that hour is incredibly valuable. Right? It takes us longer to see the benefits of automation, okay? In the a la carte world, one of the positives that we can see from this that becomes a building block that we can use out of this if we are focusing on operational efficiency at this young of an MSP or IS, ITSP age is that we're now really paring down what we need to be monitoring inside our RMM tool for what a la carte services we're offering. And we're quite distinctly breaking them up into our monitoring alert items and our monitoring items. Monitoring items being the items that come typically with some type of self remediation, though that may not be added at this particular level, that are not mission critical. Our monitoring alert items are the items that require a technician to be looking at them now, right? Think of this as a disk space check failing. Okay, it's probably a monitoring item compared to, say, a managed antivirus alert that a threat is found or a critical event check finding a large amount of security events, right? What this allows us to do as we start gaining operational efficiency here is carrying that designation up our maturity model while adding to our check set, and it makes it much easier for us to start organizing our RMM and performing routine maintenance and getting proper information out of it without dealing with a lot of white noise. Right. Starting early and young, we have the ability inside this, this tech support structure that we've all been through to bring a lot of positives with us. Right? And here, once we get two, three, four techs, we start to see the need and start to implement some basic dispatching of technicians, some basic workload or skill set, but not quite specialty. Uh, 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 assigning of tickets through ticket routing, right? We see this as a building block section that we know we have to go through, but we want to look at moving this forward, right? This is where we can implement a culture of operational efficiency, but very rarely can this be a place where we sit and expect best in class operational efficiency. And as we're building this base of operational efficiency, we have to start taking in mind that we need to still be reporting on our KPIs. We talk about in our operational efficiency bootcamp that you can't manage what you can't measure, right? And I think one of the bigger mistakes with MSPs is at this particular level, they're really not measuring much. And that's why we run into when I was a sales engineer, a PSM, or now even a head nerd, an MSP that fits our elite category spend, 
But when I go look at the 2,000 devices on the dashboard, 90 of them are throwing up white noise. 170 of those have tickets that have been open for X number of days. We're not reporting. We're not improving on it. Right, And if we don't start implementing this in the beginning of our life cycle as an MSP, we start, we start seeing pain down the road. It's easier to manage and maintain the maintenance of an RMM with 100 devices that are in a a la carte model than it is 5,000 devices that are in fully managed. Implement the behaviors early, reap the benefits later. So what we look at in our key performance indicators or our KPIs here is we're going to shoot for about 70 or 150 percent of the national average. So when we look at response time, we're looking at best in class being an hour. I'd like to get us down to an hour and a half, right? Even if it is just one of those nicety emails coming from a live person. I see your ticket. I see the problem you're having. Have you implemented this type of solution yet? Uh, and let me know. I will be with you as soon as I can, right? Maybe not that poorly worded, but you guys get where I'm going with You folks get where I'm going with this, right? Our SLA adherence is something that we never want to look at breaking, right? We want our SLA adherence to be at 100%. And at this particular level, we have the the competition of, I want 100% SLA adherence, but I also want to provide SLAs that are appropriate for being an IT service provider, right? Because we need to think about the fact that we are dealing with wildly disparate workloads and ticket volumes across a day-to-day -day basis. We can't make an SLA that's going to meet best-in-class response times. We need to make an SLA that will include the necessary buffer for us to give our clients peace of mind, but not break our contract, right? So when we look at the SLA items here throughout the rest of the slides, we're going to be looking at what we call a critical uh, uh, ticket type. And we'll cascade down to critical high, moderate, and low, but I always look at that critical number first. Where in this 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 uh, generalist world, we're going to be sitting at three to four hours, maybe even a little bit longer. I think three to four hours for a non-tiered, just pool pooled uh, uh, tech support type structure is a pretty good SLA. Our utilization rate is going to be difficult to manage. But what we're going to be looking at is rather than the percentages that we're starting with and reporting on is the fact that our utilization rate as we report month over month and generate more efficiency and try and involve this break fix a la carte model into our proactive tiers, we're going up and to the right. Whether we start at a 30% utilization rate or a 50% utilization rate, we just want to be tracking up and to the right. This isn't like one of our operationally mature models where we're looking to maintain a, uh, a utilization rate amongst all of our techs above X percent. And the same thing comes into play with ticket volume. Right, Ticket volume is wildly disparate across the board based off of how many techs you have, how quickly can your techs work, how needy are your end user accounts, how lackadaisical are your end user accounts with their day-to-day -day operations. There's just so many variables that come into ticket volumes that while we may want to look at national averages like 100 to 130 tickets per week per technician, this just isn't viable for us. We don't have the predictable business and the predictable tickets to make that particular uh, uh, metric become a target. Now, we can, again, just like utilization rate, let's look up and to the right. As I'm adding more clients, as I'm bringing in more efficiency, as I am giving my technicians more tool, I want to see this number increasing quarter over quarter, month over month. Mean time to resolution does become measurable. I think no matter what tier of tech support you are at, be the most young to the most operationally mature, we need to have a hard line on 
what we want as an organizational goal to be our mean time to resolution. And in this generalist structure, I'm gonna say we're shooting for the national average. Are we probably gonna start below that? Yes, but that's okay. okay. But our goal is to get to the mean time to resolution of three days. First time to fix here is going to be, again, incredibly uh, uh, disparate across our technicians and across organizations that fit this particular category, but we should be shooting for 65%. Okay, And that's a little bit low, I feel, compared to some of these more structured tech support organizations, but we're dealing with something that they don't have to in that we get very little insight into our client's network. We're dealing with end users word of mouth here, right? Look at issues printing, right? If we in a break fix world get called for issues printing and we can't get that service to properly run, right? We're just gonna look at reinstalling drivers and go. Might not be the root cause there, but it's the band-aid that we need to keep our ticket volume up, to keep our clientele pumping through our tech support organization so that we can maintain a reasonable revenue stream. Okay. And then the last KPI that we're going to take a look at here is going to be our net promoter score or NPS score. And what we're going to look at in this particular tier is that we expect our scores to be a little bit low, right? We are being called on when our clients are in moments of stress, right? We are always going to have a lower NPS score sheerly because of the situations that we're dealing with our end users in, okay? I think we'd like to look at ourselves and see an NPS score in the 30, maybe 40 range, but what we're more focused on here is as long as our NPS scores are remaining consistent on average or growing, we're going to focus more so on a net and gross retention number as a metric here. Okay, because we're dealing with clients that could leave us in a moment's notice. We're dealing with clients that can leave us over something as finicky as your technician picked up the phone and said, what's up, rather than hello, right? Anything, they walk. So when we focus on gross retention, great, looking at gross retention being in the 90 95% range, I think, for best in class, looking at our net retention being in the 100, 105% range for best in class, we should be feeling like we're doing well. We don't quite have to focus on our NPS scores. Once those retention metrics drop, though, that's when we need to start to look at NPS and start to utilize that as a tool to improve our services. Right, But this isn't like something like, say, you know, a 20 million ARR MSP that sees a drop in NPS scores as not only churn concern, but also overhaul of some organizational structures. I don't think we're quite to that importance of our tech support tiers. Right. Now, moving up our maturity model, we're going to start entering into this world of our tiered tech support. Now, we're looking at two variations on this here, and these are what we traditionally see almost across the board in the ITS, uh, ITSP and MSP world. These are the tried and true uh, uh, tech support structures that we see with, and I've split it into two sections, right? Tiered all together and tiered with specialties. I am not saying that the tiered all together technicians don't have a skill set that we can look at using in part of our efficiency items. What I'm saying is here, we're not going to have a specific backup tech. We're not going to have a specific security tech, right? So when we look at the structure across our tiers one, two, and three, right, we're going to see skill sets. Right? But workload cannot be solely determined by that skill set. Workload has to be determined across our tiers 
by workload against peers and maybe some skill set. Right? If I have techs one, two, and three, and tech one is best with backup, tech two is second best with backup, tech three is third best with backup, right? I'm going to be assigning by not only the ranking in the skill, but also the workload. So if tech one, who is best at backup, and I probably still want to get every backup ticket, has five tickets, tech four, or sorry, tech two has four, and tech three has three, that ticket's still going into that tech three's lap, even though they might not be the most appropriate person with this. And when we look at the way we're going to structure this, what we typically see across the board with some variation, but focusing on our smaller shops in this particular example, with a five technician shop, we're gonna see 60% of our help desk technicians be at tier one, 20% in tier two, and 20% in tier three. Okay. This allows for work group uh, uh, amongst the tiers as possible because knowledge is not specialized in an individual location. There are those with higher or lower skill, but there's no true specializations here, right? I don't have a tier three security tech who comes with a CISSP behind their name. If you do, I mean, that's awesome, but you know. What we also start to see here inside our efficiencies is our escalation process starts to become more defined, okay? And we're going to start that escalation process at tier one 100% of the time. And we're going to look at this escalation process not bringing a solution in 30 minutes, okay, but giving tier one 30 minutes to work on a ticket, researching and otherwise to determine if they can find a solution. If they cannot, this moves to tier two. Tier two gets another 30 to 45 minutes, depending on your tech's expertise level. The more expertise, the longer I'd give them, to be quite honest and we move to tier three. And the nice example that I have for this is uh, uh, yesterday, if you guys were in any of my talks um, where I was having just massive audio issues, right? I sat down on my device, I could get my audio input to work, so my microphone on my headset, but not my audio output on my headset. So I did the basics. I ran the Windows Diagnostic Tool, which we all know isn't the best, but hey, I was hoping for quick and easy and good luck, right? Couldn't solve the problem there, right? Did the old standby, restart the device, see what happens. Unplug the device or unplug my headphones, restart the device, plug my headphones back in, restart the device, and I just went through some iterations. Finally got fed up there and it was like, okay, still hasn't taken too much of my time up and still at about 10 minutes worth of work. I went in and started to start do some device management, right? Go in, audio devices, remove the audio device, remove the drivers, reinstall everything, see where I get to. Okay. Found out couldn't do that, had to find a piece of PowerShell to do it because of security concerns on my device, right? I get it. So ran that piece of PowerShell, reinstalled my headphones driver and the like, still didn't solve the problem. At this point, I'm at about the 30 minute mark. Okay. I call up my our tech support now, right? Enables internal tech support. Now, what I'm doing is very similar to this escalation to tier two, but what I'm also giving tier two here is notes. Okay. Think of it, and I, I, I think I've made this joke before, but think of tier one as Watson, right? Tier two is Sherlock. Would I rather have Watson put Sherlock in an empty room? and let them solve a problem, right? Or would I rather have some information gathering done and put Watson in a, or, or Sherlock in a room with evidence, right? I like the one that gets the answer quicker. What this also allows us to do is continue our tier one's education as they're looking at solving these problems. I'm not telling them try, I'm not telling you to trial them by fire. Still have the escalation, don't leave them high and dry. But if they have time, once that escalation process has kicked in, let them follow tier two. Hey, here's this problem. What would you do with it? Right. I come to find out that my audio issues were resolved by installing a set of drivers for an entirely different audio piece inside my device. The enable technician goes, oh, I've heard of this. Here you go. Right. Because one, 
they'd seen the problem, but two, they also came with notes. So they didn't have to do that remediation. Enable solved my problem within 10 minutes rather than an hour, right? So I like this. Now, for those of us, the audio issues might be a, a bad choice, right? Since, you know, the vast majority of you are probably just sitting there going, oh yeah, you're on a dull attitude, aren't you? Um, right, but I think it's a good example nonetheless here. Okay, for at least how our escalations are going to work. If the tier one technician can find the solution in that 30 minutes, but needs another five to 10 minutes to implement that, let them go with that. Don't kick it to tier two just to implement a solution. Kick it to tier two if research needs to be continued. Okay, and when we look at this particular structure, this works best in our large break fix, our large I, uh, uh, a la carte style ITSPs, and it works for our folks who are evolving into proactive and fully managed services. It doesn't get us quite where we need to be for proactive or fully managed, but it gives us the ability to continue growing up that maturity model, expanding our MSP, continually training our techs and introducing operational efficiency here, right? Oops, excuse me, click the button too many times, right? So we look at the cons in this particular tiering system and we look at the opportunities we have, right? We're still relying on generalists by tiering by knowledge level, but what we're doing here is adding the ability to continue education rather than being stuck tapping somebody on the shoulder, right? But also starting to fill out documentation on this so our tier one techs can learn while starting to give them the ability to research, figure out problems, see if they can solve them and follow that ticket if they have time, right? If a tier one technician is sitting on, you know, five or 10 tickets, I'm perfectly okay with them going to tier two saying, hey, I sent you this as an escalation. What would you do to solve the problem? If they're sitting on 50 tickets, come on. You know, we've got to use our better judgment here and no following the ticket up, right? We, we see ticket routing getting introduced, but it's really focused on our escalation, right? As tickets move into the tiers, we manage them by workload, maybe some skill set. As tickets move into the next tier, we manage them by workload, maybe some skill set. But it's a better building block than what we started with to look at true escalation and ticket routing management. Work is distributed by, by uh, workload or is stuck waiting for internal escalation. This allows us to quickly and easily identify kinks in the chain that we have, chinks in the armor, right? If I need to start not going by workload, but by skill and workload, I can implement this at that level. If I'm stuck waiting for an internal escalation because the expert isn't available, I need to start looking at migrating to a more concise tiered with specialties structure, right? I need to continue evolving my operational maturity in this particular case, right? Dispatchers at this level become a must, be it automated in your ticketing solution or done manually by a manager or designated dispatcher or both. Very common. Okay, allowing us to start having somebody with their fingers in the pie for operational efficiency as we go through the movement of tickets. The more streamlined I can make my escalation pack, the more streamlined I can make my ticket routing, the more streamlined this dispatcher can work, the closer I am to say having a service director inside my internal organization. We'll keep that in mind as we move up, right? Benefits of this, escalation paths are now real. Right? They might not be fully fledged, but they're real. We're testing, we're finding out which, what works best for us inside our organization. Because we're moving to subscription services and we've now tech support or, or structured our tech support organization in an efficient manner, we now, rather than losing a tech on the front lines for an entire day to do project work, right? 
or losing an engineer for an entire day to do project work, we now have compartmentalization of those big ticket items with our tier three technicians. They can now start to look at project work as a primary. Complex tickets that required escalation as a you know, secondary. Switch those around if you'd like, either one of those there. And then their third role, when they have the available time and the available skill set and the available energy, we're going to now put them towards beginning our route towards automated maintenance and automation in our self-healing processes. Taking those new and evolving fully managed and proactive contracts that we've signed and flushing out how we're going to take our contractual statement of work and turn it into an automated SOP where applicable. Right. Workload disparity is now being removed from our organization because our ticketing and escalation paths are such. Ticket volume and mean time to resolution should drop as our escalation process maintains a steady workflow, allowing us to better identify where our capacity issues are and whether or not we need to be growing our MSP by increasing our tech count. Or do we have a situation where we can grow our MSP by adding a new client? If ticket volume and mean time to resolution drop simultaneously, I can add a new client there. If ticket volume maintains the same, but mean time to resolution drops, I need to bring in a new technician to help increase my capacity before I think about bringing in a new client. And then what this also does is it frees up our time for documentation and standardization of our standard operating procedures so that when we look at bringing new techs in or in the unfortunate event that a tech leaves, our knowledge base is still easily accessible and trainable from or we're retaining that institutionalized knowledge that we want inside our organization. We're not having one tech leave and our entire tier three support going with them. Right. So we're putting down building blocks on building blocks to get ourselves into our next structure size. But before we do that, we're going to look at how this affects our KPIs. Right. Our response time is going to be similar to what we would see with no tiers at all. But what we're really doing is focusing on our structure documentation and uh, 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 escalation to drop our uh, uh, response time. Okay, We're shooting for an hour here, Okay, but what we're also looking for is our response time going down into the left or, or down into the right as we report. Right, We want to see it continually shrinking. One of the things we'll also see with this is our SLA adherence may drop a little bit, but what we're looking at doing here is dropping it to the low end of that no tiered range because we still are growing as an MSP. We still need to be cautious about the fact that while our tech support folks might not be making this mistakes, we inside our organization may have implemented something that causes a mistake. Okay, so we still need that SLA adherence to be pretty loose, okay, to cover any mistakes or any random increases in our workload due to us still being primarily break, fix, and a la carte here while evolving into that proactive and fully managed world. Utilization rate needs to be at the 60% range or higher here. Right. Escalation keeps techs working on what they should be and moving from task to task rather than a non-experienced or non-skilled technician getting stuck in a rabbit hole that they probably shouldn't be in. I don't want my tier one tech dealing with complex SQL issues. I want them to get some initial research done, pass it to tier two. If tier two can handle that, great. If not, get your research done and get it to tier three. But we haven't quite reached that golden zone of 80% utilization, right? Because we're still, again, end user based on our workload. For ticket volume, okay, for the rest of the time, we're going to look at a little bit more in the tier one world because tier two and tier three primarily 
fo uh, focus on escalations from tier one, as well as are affected by our proactive maintenance and our uh, 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 self-healing, right? But we want our tier one technicians getting anywhere from 15 to 20 tickets per day per tech or around 75 to 100 per week. A little bit low on those numbers side, I think, but numbers that we should shoot for. If we're better, great. If we're not, we need to be in this range. Okay, tier two and tier three at this particular level, I would think 10 to 15 tickets uh, per week for tier two and maybe one to three for tier three is quite appropriate. Mean time to resolution should now be matching the national average at worst, though we should be trending below it as we now have brought efficiency into our organization as a true cultural item and an item that can affect this quite heavily. First time to fix is starting to get to our 75% range because now we have our most experienced technicians generating SOPs that probably go above and beyond what our little bit less experienced tier one technicians may have handled previously in the past. And here we start to focus on NPS as a general retention metric, and we're going to tie this into our retention efforts. Okay, we still want our gross net and uh, gross and net retention to be quite high, but here we're now starting to shoot best in class. Right, we want at least to be in that 30 to 70 realm. We really want to be at the 70 plus realm. We should be striving to be best in class inside our NPS scores. The next iteration from here is going to be tiered with specialties. Okay. And just like inside our tiered text or our tiered without specialties, right? Tiers one and two, three most common names, call them what you write, bronze, silver, gold, right? Uh, rank them in power by the Ninja Turtles in your opinion, right? But we need to have some type of naming structure. So I like one, two, three. 60% tier one, 20% tier two, 20% tier three, give or take now, okay? We may be looking at say a 10 help desk personnel shop where we have five tier one techs. We have three or two, or sorry, let's go with three tier two techs and we have one tier three tech engineer and one tier three engineer slash tech, where the first tier three is going to handle the vast majority of tickets, the second tier three is there to handle the engineering side and they'll back each other up when necessary. Okay. Escalation times are now 30 minutes per tier, just like we saw, okay? But instead of escalating by workload, we're now escalating by specialist as our specialists across our tiers are able to pull tickets that necessitate their input and through efficient ticket routing or dispatching, those tickets should already be in their hands. We're ensuring that those that need to be working on this item are now working on this item. And I want to differentiate skills come with experience, specialists come with training. Right. Look at, say, I would compare myself to, say, Lewis Pope. OK, I've been in the security world since I joined Enable. Well, since I was a sales engineer. Right. So I have a skill in security. Right. However, Lewis also has that skill plus the training to go behind it. And some of that training is going to come with acronyms behind your name. Right. For instance, he would like to go for I think he's actually going to get his CISSP. If not, he might already have it. Right. Specialism comes with the professionally provided training. Right. The Microsoft uh, certs, which, you know, tier one could probably have. Let's be quite honest. Right? But, you know. You guys get where I'm going with this, right? The difference between a skill set brought on by experience and a specialty. If you have somebody who has enough skill, right, to earn one of those specialties, by all means, 
Let's look at investing in our continuing education, right? Bring those acronyms into your, 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 your environment, right? While they may not mean much to our techs, they may not mean much to us on the IT side because we're fully aware and some of the smartest people in security we've ever met don't have an acronym behind their name at all, right? What it brings is peace of mind, comfort, and credibility to our end users, right? And what we should be looking at is the lower the tier, the broader the specialty across our technicians, right? I don't want a CISSP at tier one, right? One, because it's incredibly expensive, but two, it's incredibly targeted. Right? They have a specialty that needs to be dealing with complex problems because they can target themselves and their knowledge to deal with it. Right? I'd love to have a domain expert at tier one. Right? Maybe not a cert behind it, but sounds pretty good. I'd love to have an Intune uh, uh, experienced user at tier one. Right. So think about how we're putting our people in our tiers and where we are putting putting them uh, inside our organization. Now, this tech support structure works well almost across the board, right? From the large break fix to the large MSP. But I find MSPs that are utilizing this tech support structure the most and actively investing in maintaining a continuing education so that their specialists do not fall behind are the MSPs that are maturing steadily in a reasonably consistent clip and are planning to enter or are already entering the world of the vast majority of the service delivery they provide being proactive or fully managed. Again, our larger break fix clients can handle this. Our larger a la carte partners can handle this, right? We're IT service providers. But those that are truly in this world of requiring this are in the I'm 80% fully managed and proactive 20% break fix a la carte, right? The best in class there. They're more than 50% break fix and a la carte. Right, because the structure has to be there for them. Okay. When we look at the cons of this, we look and see quite quickly individual ways we can attack, attack each one of these to combat them. Right. We look at cons of bottleneck due to experience. Right. If I have one backup specialist, I'm going to see a bottleneck there. Right? But if I'm allowing my tier one technicians the ability to be the proper research and teaching them and educating them on where to perform this research, being a good Watson to tier two Sherlock, right? I lessen those bottlenecks. I can also cross train, right? Find me a security expert who also doesn't know a reasonable amount about backup, right? Try to add some skill sets, right? One of the other things we see with this is continuing education eventually will start to get so narrow that our specialists are going to become more narrow. And that's, again, where cross-training comes into play. We need to look at preventing this outside of Tier 3. Right? Once we're large enough as an MSP and we have, say, five to six Tier 3 technicians, they could be as narrow in their specializations as they want. But understand, that also means we have close to 18 to 20 tier one techs, right? That's a pretty large MSP, okay? We need to combat possible drain on technicians whose specialty is in high demand. Let's make sure that we're actively hiring and actively maintaining our specializations in a manner that will allow our technicians to share the workload in those specialties if it is a high demand one. If I'm managing a bunch of financial offices and my vertical tends to be financial, I cannot have one SQL specialist. I need two, right? Make sure we're properly specializing our technicians for the verticals or for the clients that we're offering our services to, okay? 
one of the 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 other problems I see with this, because we're looking at MSPs that are growing at a reasonably rapid clip, right? We need to make sure our operational efficiency processes and escalations are in place before we start implementing this. As escalations getting missed without proper documentation is a problem because we're implementing a new way of escalating across our organization. Plan, test implement just like you would when we're looking at providing IT services to our end users, right? We're not going to roll out a new piece of software without testing it internally first. We shouldn't look at rolling out a new efficiency structure or a new tech support structure without doing some testing first. Then we look at smaller shops that are dealing with this, right? And it's something that we have to take as a name of the game here in that we might not have the ability to have a specialist at each tier, right? If I'm a five uh, help desk technician MSP, I'm not gonna have a CISSP on staff, right? Oh no, I can't make a sock at that point, but I can get my hands on a security expert that can function as a specialist. while also more than likely bringing a bit more to the table as well, okay? What we see here as well is while dispatching is still a need, ticket automation or automated ticket routing and ticket workflow should be taking over the dispersal of tickets. Escalation is going to typically remain to be a manual process amongst your organization, so continual training there needs to happen. But more and more, that's going to become the role of the dispatcher, and we need to start moving the dispatcher away from this. Right. The accurate reporting on our tickets and the manual move through our escalation process means that we can now take this dispatcher who's worked our way up this maturity model with us into another role. That dispatcher is now a great place to sit in operations, right? sit as a manager of service delivery or a service delivery director. Right. Utilize the people that you have on staff. And when we look at the fact that I may not need a dispatcher anymore, I'm not letting somebody go. I'm taking the skill set that they've learned over the evolution of our business and putting them somewhere else. Right. Probably should be a pro, but I put it in the cons column so they'd be equal. You want to give an opinion on that? <laughs> Slap it in the questions pane. Right. The pros of this is our ticket escalation process has now become fully fleshed and is based and backed with standard operating procedures that directly pull from our contractual obligations in our SOWs. And it is now rigorously promoted by the company as a piece of our culture, right? This is allowing us now to start to take the next step, okay? Those with the most knowledge and the least tickets get tickets first. Our ability to skip tiers when issues arise now becomes a part of our escalation process. If I have SQL database problems, I probably want this to go to tier two. If I have a, a malware attack, I don't want tier one touching that. I want it to go to my security person. And now we have the ability to build these caveats into our escalation processes to get the tickets to the right place first. Targeting automation, right, can now become not only routine maintenance, our self-healing, our repetitive and redundant problems. We can now start to target automation to role-specific or product-specific, not only technicians and activities, but also items inside our organization. Look at our dispatcher example. Right. We're now automating this specific role. Let's take that resource that we have and put it in another spot that's more beneficial to our company. Right. We now have the ability to hire a tier three tech or engineer with automation as a primary focus and they back up our, our help desk. This also keeps them involved in the help desk though, right? Who dictates where you build most of your uh, automation outside of what you have listed in your contract? The tier one folks 
turning in reports that says, here's my top 10 ticket types. Here is my top 10 worst offenders. Here are the top five most redundant things I do in a day. Can we automate them? Right. And having that built into our tech support and our help desk system is invaluable. Okay. Here, as we get larger, we'll start to see our help desk and our engineering branch apart from each other as departments. Okay. But we still want that communication to be there. Right. Going back to if I have an organization where I'm looking at 15 to 20 tier one techs, if I'm looking at, you know, six to 10 tier two techs and three tier three technicians, I probably am going to have a team of five to six engineers separate from that to handle automation and my proactive services, right? But until we're at that large of a point, you know, maybe not that large, maybe a little bit smaller, but until we're at that point, we need to look at knock and help desk managing proactive and fully managed services being a team together. This is also where we start to see our technicians, both in the tier with specialties and non-specialties side, start to split off for on-site technicians. Right. Once we grow to the point where we can start to look at hiring a set of technicians specifically for on-site, right, we start to evolve. Our operational efficiency options start to grow. Right. And then the easiest part of this or the biggest benefit of this particular structure is no matter how small you are or no matter how large you are. If you can support at least five technicians in a tiered with specialties range, you can continue this on for the life of your MSP. No matter how big or small you are, this particular teal, tier, teal, tier will work well for you. And here's where we see our uh, uh, key performance indicators starting to be a, I'm going to be best in class across the board item, right? Our response time in the first 60 minutes, okay, or an hour now is not just, I know you're here, I will get to your ticket, have you tried A, B, and C, right? It's pertinent information regarding that ticket and driving to a solution in the first hour. Okay, a little bit of a difference, but still response time for 60 minutes. Our utilization rate, depending on the size of our business, is now pushing from 65 to 70%, starting to get in that good tier. If we're a larger MSP, we need to be at 80%. As we're focusing, focusing on each tech's area of expertise and expecting a much larger endpoint pool, right? If our technicians are seeing a lot of downtime, we're above capacity, bring in new clients. If our technicians are at, say, a 90% utilization, we need to go back to the drawing board with some of our efficiencies and free up some of their time so that they can do the high value items like working on project work at tier three or building automation at maybe tier three, possibly tier two, right? Ticket volume at tier one is now reaching best in class where we're gonna be striving to get 15, uh, 20 tickets per day per technician, maybe even look at pushing forward into the high end of our ticket volumes on a national average to 130, 125 tickets per day or per week. Tier twos and tier threes here, still looking at sitting at the appropriate range for your organization, right? At this particular level, if we're shooting for best in class, I'm looking at tier two in the 15 to 20 per week. I'm looking at tier three into three to six per week. And it's per tech because we're implementing the proper documentation, SOPs, and automation. Meantime to resolution. We're moving away from that national average of three days in our smaller MSPs down to about two and a half. In our larger MSPs, we're shooting for best in class at two. First time to resolution should be at, or starting to get to the 75% range due to standardization of work and appropriate research, right? Tier one feeding tier two, tier two feeding tier three, the proper information to get their job done in an efficient manner as best they can. Right. But we should be thinking at a larger MSP. We're now identifying root causes with regularity and we're now trying to see an 85, 90 
truly operationally efficient with exceptional tech support representatives, maybe 92 to 95% first time to resolution. So that is incredibly high. Okay, our net promoter score, we should now be shooting for best in class point blank, 70 plus. Now, from here, we start to see an evolution of tech support in those MSPs that are operationally efficiently driven and want to break away from the norm, right? And again, as I mentioned, tiered with specialties tech support works across the board. It works for IBM, right? It works for Microsoft. It works for these large providers. It works for every MSP I've ever seen implement it. These additional ways of structuring our tech support are looking at combining functions of other departments into our tech support structure in a, a method that is designed to increase client retention as well as increase our tech support effectiveness in small subsets of clients. So what we see here is we're going to look at a technical account manager with tiers underneath them. So we're going to start with the understanding that this is not for a small MSP. We're looking at mid-size or larger MSPs adopting these final two structures. But these are evolutions that we can start to shoot for if we are in the you know, mid-operational maturity tier as a larger MSP or as a medium-sized MSP, because each of these particular structures, both the technical account and pod structure, are going to require us to have a certain amount of clients in this medium small business range. And what I mean to say here is if I'm going to look at starting a technical account manager structure, which is going to be a book of business comprised of 25 to 30 accounts assigned to a technical account manager or TAM. And I'm going to say TAM from here on because it's just easier and I'm lazy, right? So 25 to 30 accounts of 50 people, 50 end users. Okay. If it's 20, I might assign 40. Okay. If it is, if it's a hundred, I may assign 20. Right? But what I'm looking at is that reasonable amount of accounts where we are going to be in the three to 500 device per technician range, reaching high into the auto, auto, uh, operational efficiency range, assigned to a TAM that will have three to five support technicians below them that will support both on-site and remote help desk project work and some engineering for these clients. Now, engineering in this particular role is going to fall within the TAM and more than likely a separate department supporting them because our TAM is going to operate as a tier three technician and technical consultant to the end users. They are going to be involved, not just sit in, but involved in the QBRs. They're going to review tickets. They're going to review issues. They're going to review our proactive and fully managed insight or end central or RMM reporting to generate a consultative style approach to evolving our end users. And they're going to be responsible for this while also being a product manager for the folks underneath that. So we're more than likely going to see at the smaller end of this a TAM with one tier two and two tier one support representatives under them managing roughly 1,500 devices. Okay, maybe a little bit more. Okay. Once we get to the larger side of this, the largest one I found was a little bit above what we're talking about here, um, but that was, I think, an outlier. The largest of this was a TAM with a tier three underneath them, a tier two, and three tier one technicians, and that TAM worked exclusively as a project manager and engineer for the accounts under their book of business. 
okay? in addition to the engineering department or the NOC department that that MSP had. Okay, and we're looking at implementing this in an organization that can start by creating two TAM books of business. We want to start with two. We want to hammer out some of the simplistic but tedious problems as we're going through our initial creation phase of this, not our growing phase of this. What I mean is client delegation, organizational needs, capacity decisions, right? Am I going to be able to stress these TAMs a little bit more because of the quality of help desk person I have? And I can look at putting 40, 50 end user accounts underneath our TAMs with four technicians or three technicians because of how efficient we are. Do I need to lessen that number? Right? Where am I going to go with this? And what we're looking at doing here is not only providing higher levels of customer service, we're also looking at providing a familiar face and familiar consulting with our end users that will drive retention while allowing for growth. Because what's going to happen is as we're bringing new clients in, we're going to introduce them to an existing TAMS book of business and once we reach our crux of utilization, ticket volume, and uh, mean time to resolution metrics that we've decided that means we need more capacity at our organization, we're going to add another tech underneath that TAM, typically tier one. Okay, add another client or two, bring in that new tier two tech. Okay, add another client or two, start to get ourselves to the point where we're at about 150% of our TAM's original capacity. So in my particular example here of 30 accounts, we're now at 45. And we're going to look at then bringing in a TAM, hiring a second to train under our initial technical account manager. And once we read about, about 175% of our original capacity right, that 21 mark, that 22 mark, that 24 mark in this example, we're going to split those two TAM teams apart, and we're going to come up with our third, okay? Now, we're attacking this from a technical uh, uh, lens here, right? We're understanding the fact that our TAMs are going to be highly specialized people with an incredible breadth of knowledge, right? If I was an MSP and I got to pick someone to be a TAM, it would be someone from the head nerds team like Paul Kelly or Jason Murphy or Mark Andre or, or Lewis Pope or Eric Harless, right? I'd like to say myself in that, but you know, I, I, I think I'm, I'm reasonable at the job. I think those guys are all stars, okay? You know, we need to be 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 taking this as a a item as we're starting to implement this. Okay. We also need to be aware that while there is an engineering team outside of our tech support organization now in this particular item, we're big enough to support that. Our TAM is going to act as an engineer for their book of business. And we're going to look at as long as that process can be shared across our organization, the TAM's probably the most hands-on with creating it. If I need an incredibly specialized piece of automation, I want my engineering team handling it because they're the ones who specialize in that, right? My TAM may be really good with PowerShell, but on my engineering team, if I have somebody who can write in Python, I probably want them doing more developing, okay? The TAMs are also going to be responsible for looking at generating SOPs as a team, okay? So we have account management here. We have operational efficiency increases coming from these TAMs, right? While also being a great resource coming up through our tech or our, our help desk and on-site support route, okay? We're going to leave the management to a point at a division above our TAMs. There's still going to be a service director. There's still going to be 
a head of on-site and a head of remote support, and we're going to be filtering through the TAMs. While the, the tech support representatives can go through the TAM for this, the direct day-to-day -day management of our teams is still going to be outside of that TAM's hands. Because what we're doing here is essentially taking a tier three tech slash engineer and turning them into account management on top of that. Now, that doesn't mean we still don't need internal sales. Got to still be there. Somebody has to grow services with the help of a TAM, right? Or the TAM has to grow services with the help of somebody else, right? TAMs could be given the leeway to get contracts signed for certain things, like maybe project work, but we're still going to need sales and account management oversight of that side of the house. I want the TAM focusing on technical, right? It's in their in their title. So what do we look at the cons of this, right? As we mentioned, hiring a TAM is not easy. Finding this person is going to be more difficult. It's going to require some time. The initial aligning of clients and doing this for the first time while transitioning to this structure is going to be difficult. That's why we're doing it in the transition and not upon first growth. Right? We want to do this in the transition with two teams so that we can set expectations for our clients. In Q1, during our QBR, we are adjusting our structure. Here's why we're doing this. Here's the benefits it's going to provide you. Right, This is what we're doing. And as you migrate to this structure over the next quarter or the next six months, your end users aren't being blindsided by the fact that this is coming on. It allows you to work out some of the kinks that you may see, and our end users are going to be much more understanding as long as we're working our way through this situation. Whereas if we created a single TAM environment without telling them and then all of a sudden split it, we're running into all those roadblocks while growing, which just sounds incredibly difficult to me. Okay. Once a TAM's book of business limits are met, growth will slow. Right, because these processes are not easy to handle, right? But we're still allowing for growth. And what we're allowing for here is easier growth to capacity with the ability to bring on larger clients in an easy fashion. Okay. I'm building in clients to my customer retention. So the name of the game here on the pro side is we're now working with re, uh, retention as a primary focus of this and attacking it from the technical side, right? Where we're attacking this through familiar and consistency of the way services are offered as well as the consulting services of our TAM sitting with our QBRs and our MBRs with these clients. Smaller subsets of management underneath each individual TAM means that our KPIs can easily be improved and our reporting is going to be better to start to judge where we are best in class wise. Right? Technicians access to key decision makers at this TAM level allows for smoother day to day operations, better continual training, both internally and externally when we're working with technicians that are on a ticket or technicians that may not know how to solve a particular problem. Right. And what we're doing here is while the TAM isn't going to be so much responsible for actual management of these technicians, we're still bringing technicians downstream or still bringing management downstream. Right. Because the TAMs are just by their nature going to handle some of this ticket escalation is going to get to them and it's going to stop. We're not going to need to bring in management to an escalation process because the TAM is the technical manager. Right, the technical account manager, if you will. Those are the people you want those escalations stopping at. The folks who have the relationship, the knowledge, and the skill set to solve them. Right. So moving this these management style functions downstream allows our directors, our C suites, our managers, our VPs, our business owners to focus more on working in the business than outside of the or than in the business. If I can take 45 minutes of a business owner's day off their books because they're no longer handling a customer complaint that doesn't require management, but there's not anybody better to handle it because of tiered tech support. I love the fact that I have that TAM there. That's 45 minutes that I can put forth to making that TAM slice e easier by focusing on operational efficiency.
And here's where we get to our key performance indicators. So we're going to see this the same in TAMs as it is when we move to pods, right? Under no uncertain terms, should we not be best in class at least here? We should be leading the way. Implementing a structure like this means that we have or, or we are so operationally mature or moving to being so operationally mature that we are starting to lead the way in these KPIs. And this is something we need to take in mind, right? Because of familiarity with text, because of the relationships we're building, our first time to response is going to be as low as 45 minutes. I talked to one of our TAM partners. They were in the 35-minute range for first response. Right. And a lot of that's due to the fact that there's a technical account man manager implementing automation and processes at the end user that are a little more customized to them to make it so that tier one tech support doesn't have to deal with a lot of fluff. Right. Our SLA adherence, now we're looking at critical tickets being responded to in an SLA format at two hours. For those of you who were in the um, operational efficiency call yesterday in the morning. If you want to start implementing your service level objectives, this is the level we do it at, right? Utilization rates of 75 to 80% should be the norm here, right? And we've talked in depth in operational efficiency as why I think 80% is about the limit, but we should be here, okay? Ticket volume is, again, a little bit flexible here, but now we're bringing our technicians to the high end of average, if not further, where we're looking at tier one solving 130 tickets per week. We're looking at our tier two technician in the high levels of this. We're looking at our TAM, seeing less of these super hyper complex issues, but going deeper into the project work, which you know, typically gets managed through some type of ticket management or product management system. So we'll count that as ticket solved, right? Mean time to resolution is two days at national best in class or moving ahead of it, okay? First time to resolution is above and beyond the call of duty. We're targeting 85, 90% here to become truly best in class. And then we're going to split our NPS now into two effective sections. We're going to look at our external NPS scores, which should be at the 60 to 70 range, if not higher. Okay. And we're going to look at an internal NPS score, quarterly uh, uh, surveying our technicians. How, how, how likely are you to recommend working here to a friend or colleague, zero to 10? Right. We should be at 50% there. Okay, these KPIs should now be reaching truly best in class. The other half of this particular motion that I've, I've learned about talking to our partners is the pod structure. So this TAM structure comes at this from a very technical and consultative style method. This pod structure is going to be based more off of customer service. So the give and take I think we see between the two structures here is going to be that the pod is bringing a little bit more of the day-to-day -day management downstream, whereas the TAM is bringing more of the account management into this. Okay. So what we're going to have in this structure is going to be a little bit different, where we're going to look at still having pods or account books of business, right? So each of these three items here being a pod, right? And then we have one in the middle and one over here just to get them all circled, right? Plus I don't get to use the laser too much in webinars. Thank you guys for that. Um, so you know, seeing these pods, we're going to look at structuring them in a manner where we're still going to be at that 20 to 30 customer team. We're still going to be looking at the three to 500 devices per technician range. If you want to add the wrinkle in, each technician should be bringing in 250 KARR, add that as well. 
But what we're looking at splitting up here is going to be the technical services almost entirely for the benefit of customer success. So the account management side of this is still a distinct organization here, whereas in the TAM structure, we bleed over a little bit, right? And what we're going to see is we're going to have a director of service that's going to manage all four of the team leads in this particular representation. And the top three team leads of our pods, right? So here, here, and here, right? These three team leads are going to lead our remote support and uh, 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 portions of engineering for their books of business. The team lead is going to be responsible for the management of these pods. Now, most commonly, I see three technicians per pod. So a little bit more of going back to kind of non-tiered, but we're still going to see a tier of these techs, right? Then on the bottom of this, we're gonna continue our pod with two on-site and project workers, right? But they're not gonna have their own team lead. Every three to four pods is going to have a team lead for their on-site workers, okay? Each pod gets its own team lead for remote, on-site gets a team lead for every three to four pods, right? And this is due to the fact that if we look at on-site work being vastly smaller as a percentage-wise than our remote work, it starts to make sense. But those team leads are still going to be the management portions of these teams, creating highly uh, 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 specialized choke points for management. Again, bringing management downstream so that our directors, our VPs, our Cs, our owners can start focusing on working on the business rather than in the business. And we're basing this off of familiarity of tech support because we're not bringing account management into this. The team leads will sit in QBRs, right? But we're not going to have them leading QBRs like say a TAM, okay? We're not gonna have them selling services. We'll have them consulting on it, right? But with a little bit less of a heavy hand than the TAM. Okay, the job of these pods here is to build familiarity and comfort with the efficiency of tech support being offered to our end users through the help desk, remote or on site, and put a happy and familiar face in front of them each time. Okay. Right. This allows us to know the quirks of our clients better. This allows us to know the needs of our clients better. This gives our tech support teams the autonomy to start to look at generating individual client-based engineering or uh, project work to bring about higher efficiency. While knowledge should be shared across teams, right? you may see a little bit more that the, the team lead has to step in, do some engineering work and start building something truly customized for one of their clients that may not translate into the next pod. The other thing to keep in mind here is support from the pods is going to bleed. If pod one at tier one has 10 open tickets at a point in time and pod two has 50, the techs from tier one should be helping tier two with their tickets coming in taking precedence, okay? But we should see that interchangeability. We should see that work across pods as we need. Growing pods is gonna work the same as growing our TAM books of business. And we can see an example inside the structure with the middle pod. That middle pod has capped out at 30 technicians. I am about to land a new deal. I'm gonna bring in a third on-site technician right, since their work might not be the most tickets, but it's definitely the most time consuming, especially with the project work world. And I'm going to bring in that new remote support technician to support the addition of a new client or two. After that, as we get to that 
150% of original capacity point, I will have hired a team lead. Now, team lead is probably the first person I should start looking for in my hiring process, but the remote or sorry, the on-site workers are going to be the first I hire because again, hiring a team lead is complicated, right? From there, we'll hire a uh, remote help desk. Person number four will bring in our fifth uh, on-site project uh, uh, worker. We'll bring in our final two remote help desk workers as we hit 175% of original capacity, and then we'll split by mitosis again. Okay, and we look at these being items that fall in the grow or in the pro or con place. First things, moving folks across TAMs tends to be a little bit easier than moving folks across pods, typically because account management and pods are going to be involved in the QBR in some fashion, while the pod team leader won't be leading them, they're at least sitting in. And this is going to breed familiarity across two departments, typically one account manager or so per team lead, maybe one account manager for two team leads, but that's your organizational decision, right? Um, at Enable, you know, we were seeing our, our PSMs and our account management team, excuse me, uh, uh, managing 150, sometimes up to 300 accounts, but you know, the 300 account range was not my, my, my happiest place to sit but I digress, right? And what this means for us is once a client gets put in a pod, it's in a pod. Take that as a pro or a con as you will. I looked at it as a con because it just means a little bit more difficult end user management, especially if we get a disgruntled end user, okay? This also means that growth is slower when splitting pods, right? TAM growth is going to be quicker because we have somebody built into that structure that's actively working on consulting and growing the business in a more targeted fashion, where inside the team lead world here, we still want that consulting behavior, we still want that growth need, but it's less of a focus. Hiring is much more rigorous for our hiring, hiring position or higher positions, just like we saw for TAMs. Right, and here, just like in the TAM world, reporting can get much, much more of a of a rabbit hole. I think a little bit more so than the TAM world, um, because pods are also controlling a little bit more in the on-site and project work. Um, whereas in the TAM world, right, we're we're seeing reporting to be a little bit more broad. Now, on the, the benefit side of this, familiarity is key. It's the name of the game to retention, right? Quicker resolution, better retention, more familiarity. Sorry, I have a little bit of a coughing fit there. My apologies. Okay. And what we see kind of juxtaposing our growth is slower, onboarding is quicker, both in the technician or the employee side and the customer side. The ability to find your clients and get them to grow within your business is going to be more difficult, right? Because we can't add them at an exponential clip, but the onboarding should go pretty smoothly at this point. And the training should go pretty smoothly as well, right? Onboarding, maybe not discovery being easier. We have the ability to assign larger clients. If I need to look at vastly adjusting where my, my team lead numbers sit, where I bring in an individual client that has a thousand devices, all right, I can have a team lead managing 10 accounts, right? So my ability to bring in larger clients is improved. And just like inside the TAM world, managing more than 300 devices, while 300 is our beginning of being good, it's much easier to scale up here. Ticket statuses or ticket stats tracked in pods and throughout the entire organization, okay, do make reporting a little bit easier as we can compare pods individually or track pods to 
uh, or sorry, compare pod to pod or track individually or track company. But we start to see where that granularity and ease of information pulling starts to become a rabbit hole in reporting, right? Analysis paralysis can become a very big thing here. And then we look at our KPIs, right? Very similar to what we saw in the TAM world, okay? Or nigh identical to what we saw in the TAM world because here we're starting as a operationally mature MSP and we're discovering inventive ways to increase some metrics that we may have been down on. Client retention, right? Internal uh, employee health, right? NPS scores. Right? We're using this as a tool in our tool belt to increase the metrics inside our operational efficiency. We'll end here with thank you folks so much for attending. Um, I'm very happy we found a good amount of value in this session. Um, if you have any feedback, again, feel free to email me, joseph.furla at enable.com. Um, and when we're, we're giving feedback, if we are going to email, please also think about this is a comparatively short boot camp to what we originally offered with, say, our three-hour operational efficiency one or our two-and-a-half to three-hour technical lab-containing boot camps. And if you offer any feedback on, I like bite size better, I like the shorter ones better, you know, that, that or worse, or I you know, prefer to see this structure, that'd be much appreciated as well. Um, we're looking at evolving a lot of our boot camps in the head nerd world as some are as old as three years. And, you know, we need to evolve as a, a portion of the enable organization with our end users. Or, and and, and well, I shouldn't say our end users, with your end users and our partners, right? You you guys get to evolve with your end users alone. We've, we've got to have the two layers to come into it. And we want to make sure we're providing pertinent and good information to you folks. You folks have a good day. And I'll see you in the next office hours or boot camp. Bye-bye.